Hello, my name is James Sanderson, and I'm the evangelism minister here at the Brown Street Church of Christ in Waxahachie, Texas. And we are glad to have you with us today. Um, I have put this lesson together a while back, and I never created a video on it. And I said to myself, well, I, need, I need to get this out. It's on the story of the flood. And a lot of people speculate stories in the Bible. Did they really happen? Are they really true? Are they just made up stories? And one of the stories that they really speculate is the story of the flood. Well, today we're going to see, did the story of the flood really happen? Today, we're going to prove that it did. So you stay with me. and Let's see if we can put some facts to the story. All right. So there is Noah's Ark, right? Told about in the Bible. Out there with Noah and his family on, the, on this boat uh, for a year and about a month. That was quite a long time to be out there. Now, here's a question. If we're going to start this story, we're going to have to ask ourselves why. Why did the flood take place? Well, let's, let's see. So we go over here to Genesis chapter 6, at the beginning of our Bibles, and hope you read along here. This is verse 5 through 8. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become. And that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. Can you imagine that? God being grieved that he made us. So the Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I have created from the face of the earth. Men and animals and creatures that move along the ground, the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So, he was evil all the time. All the time. Look, I know our world is bad, okay? But we're not that bad. And we may be getting there, but we're not that bad. Can you imagine someone's thoughts all the time are evil, evil, evil? And God's grief that he made man. But we got, a, we got another family here. We got Noah and his family. He found favor in God's eyes. Verse 11, Now the earth was corrupt in God's sight. It was full of violence. God saw how corrupt the earth had become, for all the people of the earth had corrupted their ways. So God said, No, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So God's going to take it out. And again, this was just on everyone's mind all the time. God gave man choice, and his choices led him down a wrong road. A very, very wrong road. You have a very corrupt world at this time. Here's another question that we need to answer. How long? A lot of people want to know, how long did it take for Noah to build the ark? Okay, well, there's some speculation over this. Let's go see. So in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 3, it says, When men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will, cannot tent, will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. Okay. So from this, people get the idea that it, took 120 years. I'm not going to contend with man forever. I'm going to give him 120 years. I'm going to wait because God is patient. We're going to see a verse like that in a minute. But after 120 years, I'm bringing the flood. I want you to look at the contents here again. Um, I understand this differently. See if you follow me. My spirit will not contend with man forever. He is mortal. His days will be 120 years. So here's Noah. How long did it take to build that ark? Okay, I'm sure it took, took a while. Well, we know that God is patient. In fact, look what God was allowing man to do. He was allowing man prior to the flood to live eight, nine hundred years, almost a thousand years old. Now, that's a long time. Now, here man, here God has been putting up with man. He's been allowing him to live a long, long time. And what's happening to man? 
He's not turning to them. And they're just getting more evil and more evil and more evil. But notice after the flood, the age of man. After the flood, it goes down dramatically. Could that be what he's talking about? I'm not going to contend with man forever. His year shall be 120. That's what I understand this to, to say. I don't believe the Bible tells us how long it took for that ark to be built. I'm sure it took a while. But I don't think it's telling us that it was 120 years. But that's just my thoughts. You, you wrestle with us and you see what you think. Because 2 Peter 3 9 says, The Lord is, is not slow in keeping his promise. As some understand slowness, he is patient with you. He has been so patient with me. Not wanting anyone to perish. Does, does God want people to perish? Absolutely not. But he wants everyone to come to repentance. But the question is, how long? How long will God give them? Apparently, he's not going to give you forever. So he's not going to contend with man forever. And there's those people that didn't get on that ark. And guess what happened to them? They died. All of them. They waited too long. And once that door was shut, that was it. Now, the question that rises in some people's minds are how many people were on the earth back then? How many people actually died in the flood? How many people got on and how many people died? Well, let's see. Chapter 7 of Genesis with the story here of the flood says every living thing that moved on the earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures swarm over the earth and all mankind. I remember when I was in preaching school at Sunset School of Preaching. and Let me see. It was I was there from 98 to 2000 and somewhere in there a story of Noah's Ark came out. It was a movie. We were all excited. We wanted to watch it. You know, we're all studying the Bible. And it shows a boat in this movie coming up with a bunch of other people on it getting on the ark with Noah and they're all talking and hanging out. And it's like, wait a minute. There wasn't any other people. They all died. All of them. That's what the Bible says. Everything a dry land that had breath of life in its nostrils died. Every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out. Men and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds of the air were wiped from the earth. Only Noah was left and, and those with him, with him in the ark which is his family there was eight so how many people do you think was on the face of the earth at that time how many perished here's an interesting article if the growth rate in the pre-flood world was equal to the growth rate in 2000 which is 0.012 there could have been about 750 million people at that time of the flood. It's a lot of people. However, given the extremely long lifespans prior to the flood, the growth rate could have been much higher, increasing the rate by just 0.001 would put the population close to 4 billion at the time of the flood. Four billion that's a lot of people these are believed to be things that were made prior to the flood they were found in coal man-made objects found in coal prior to flood times and they seem to date very very old could these have been from the time of the flood did man actually live back then and exist? The uh, Bible says they did. So then the question is this. Let's talk about Noah's Ark. Can it be found? Where is it? Where, if, if, if it took place, is there any evidence? It's a good question. People want to know. So this is Mount Ararat. This is where the Bible says that the Ark rested in this area. 
Okay, it's a pretty good chunk amount there, isn't it? Okay, this is bordering Turkey, Russia, and Iran, I believe, pretty, or Iraq. Pretty, pretty hostile area. Okay, to say the least. So there it is. Chapter 8, verse 4 and 5 of Genesis says, Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the seventeenth day of the month, on the mountains of Aaron. Did you notice the word I underlined there, or the, or the letter? It says it landed in the mountains of Aaron. didn't say it landed on Mount Aaron. It's in the mountains of Aaron. So it could have landed on the mountain, but it could also be in the mountain range. So here is the Rocky Mountains. Okay, you see that? Do you see where it goes? Well, it's in three different uh, countries, lots of different states, different provinces of Canada. If I told you that I parked my car in the Rocky Mountains, where could it be? <laughs> it could be, I didn't really give you a lot of detail, did, did I? This is a view of the mountains of Ararat. There's actually an upper and a lower, or, or a bigger and smaller Mount Ararat. It can be anywhere in that mountain range. Okay, so if I said I parked my car in in, uh, in the Rocky Mountains, it could be anywhere in that range. Okay, it doesn't specifically have to be on the mountain. <laughs> This is a picture, and this is about 12 miles from the bigger Mount Ararat. Okay, and you look at this thing and you go, hmm, what is this? Well, you see some people over here, and they're walking. This is believed by some to be Noah's Ark. It was found by the YouTube, YouTube spy plane uh, back, you know, in Russia and the United States, the Cold War. I think it was maybe in the 60s or 70s it was spotted, okay? Some believe that's it. Well, we're going to see. So, how did they build? How did they build? Well, this is a picture of, uh, if you've been here, in Kentucky, uh, where this group of people got together and built Noah's Ark, and I would really like to go there, okay? And you can see its shape. It's it's shaped like a boat. Okay. Let's see what the Bible says about this. So in Genesis 6, he's telling Noah how to make it. He says, make yourself for you an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you're to build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Okay, now this is... The NIV taking these measurements, okay, and trying to put them into our language today, okay? Make a roof for it and finish the ark to within 18 inches of the top. Put a door on the side of the ark uh, and middle, uh, uh, and make lower, middle, and upper decks. So there's going to be three stories. Okay? Well, this fits the biblical narrative. Okay, it is 515 feet long, which is more accurate to the Bible. Um, it has upper, middle, and lower decks. There seems to be one door, and you have it shaped like a boat. It is wider, the Bible says, but it probably kind of fell out. Okay, now, what has happened is, is over years earthquakes, volcanoes, and things filled this with dirt. And the wood that is here is petrified. Okay? And you can see this here when you go to the side of this. You can see the discoloration of the dirt. And this would be the petrified wood, which is the decoloration of this, of the or the off-coloration of, uh, of these rib timbers. That it ribs out like a boat. This seems to be a man-made object here. Okay. And you can see that with these pictures. And you can see the rib timbers. 
It's pretty interesting. Okay. Verse 13, chapter 8 says, By the first day of the first month of Noah's 601st year, the water had dried up from the earth. Noah then removed the covering of the ark and saw that the surface of the ground was dry. Okay. So we see here that there's actually a covering over the ark. Well, here's what we find laying next to this in this field. You find these petrified pieces of bark. Okay. Would have been a mass, would be massive, massive trees. And it was like these were thrown off and laying next to this ark, sitting 12 miles from out Ararat. Could that be the covering? Could very possibly be. Then what they did was they took sonar and they ran it over the top of this, what they believed to be Noah's ark, this, this whatever this big old chunk of dirt here is. And when they did that, they, they it kept going off. And you'll see these little these little stones here where they marked it. And here's what they're finding. Hundreds of these fossilized rivet heads. There's the piece of metal in the middle. And around it is a petrified piece of wood. And these spikes go into it. And they are all over the all over this thing. That's pretty interesting. Again, whatever this is, it's definitely uh, a man-made structure. Then we find something else that's interesting. There's 13 of these stones. They're about two tons in size and weight. And they are laying next to the ark. And each one of them has a hole at the top. Okay? Now, what would you do with that hole? Well, I find this interesting that when you look at um, these, the oldest ships, remains that they can find in the Mediterranean Sea, that's where the world really started was in that area, they find anchor stones that are next to these ruins, okay? And they were used for buoyancy, okay? So they would, they would keep the, the, the ship afloat. So if those waves got really rocking and stuff, those those huge stones would would keep it from from turning over. Now, there's no record in the Bible that those stones existed or God told them to put those stones there. But these are interesting. Could they be anchor stones from the ark? Don't know. Then they took out. They found this big petrified piece. Of, well, not petrified piece of dirt because dirt doesn't petrify. But this big chunk of dirt, and they drilled into it. And they there was one cavity that was not filled in. There it is. And they sucked everything out of that. And what did they find? They find they found ancient animal animal hair and a, and a horn to a deer inside of this. That would fit the ark pretty good, wouldn't it? I think it would. Now, the question is this, how much water? How much water? Well, in chapter 7 of the uh, flood story, the Bible says in, the, in verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day all the springs of the great deep burst forth, and the floodgates of the heavens were opened. And the rain fell on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. Okay? So let's say it rained here in Texas for 40 days and 40 nights. How much water would you have? Well, let's see how much water there was. So here is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Do you see this? It's almost like, when you look at the earth, it's almost like it's got this big crack in it. And it goes all the way around on both sides. Okay. All right. Now, the waters rose and covered the mountains to a depth of more than 20 feet, or 15 cubits, okay, which would have been the Egyptian measurement. That's pretty high, isn't it? If it rained for 40 days and 40 nights here in Texas, would you have enough water that would go over the top of Mount Everest? 
Mount Everest is 5.49 miles above sea level. Would it be able to go 20 feet or 15 cubics over the top of that thing? But I don't think so. But here's the deal. That wasn't all the water. The water burst forth from the deep. And just the other day, we had heard on the news that they have found this massive amount of water under the ground that is bigger than all of our oceans. It seemed like that would be on the world news, wouldn't it? Well, it would, because it would help prove Noah's Ark. But, you know, the world's not going to do that, are they? The proof is there. That's where the water came from. Now, guess what you find on top of these mountains? So here's Noah's Ark, 15 cubics above the highest mountain. And what do you find? You find petrified oysters. Now, do you see how big these oysters are? You don't see oysters that size on your uh, Chinese buffet bar, do you? No. These are in the Andre Mountains in Peru. The biggest is 11.5 feet across. Well, remember, before the flood, everything was big. Animals were big. People were big. People lived long. Animals lived long. Everything was bigger, right? What do they do and up on top of a mountain? Well, there was this flood, and it flooded the whole earth. In fact, if you go and you look at the top of all these mountains, including Mount uh, Everest, guess what you find? Seashells. Seashells are on the top of all of the mountains. Well, how'd they get up there? Well, there was this flood, and then it flooded the whole earth, and it moved all that stuff around, and there they are. Is that proof? I think it is. I think it is. Yeah. So you want some more proof? Okay, let's talk about some more proof. So I've got, I went down to Glen Rose, Texas, and they've got a, a creation museum down there, okay? And at this cre creation museum, they... They've got this book, and I bought a, I've got a couple books. They're big books. And and one of the books tells about all of these. Well, let me let me see. Let me see if I've got this on the. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, we can't go back. Oh, my apologies. I forget when I'm using this PowerPoint. But what that chart just showed. You go back and slow it down. Just freeze the frame. Okay. And you're gonna see. All these different nations that tell about Noah's Ark, okay? They're going to tell about the story of Noah's Ark. There's stories, uh, ancient stories of Noah's Ark, one flood, one family, one boat, everybody else died. At the Hawaiian Islands, in Alaska, uh, Japan, the Chinese have this in their history, the Babylonians. In fact, the Babylonians. When they write the record of Noah's Ark in their history, they place that Ark in that field. Right there, right smack dab in that field. That's 12 miles away from Mount Ararat. Well, the reason nobody really paid attention to them is because they didn't really believe in God. And so nobody took their story serious. But they should have, because they would have found the Ark. So, what I'm saying is there is over 35 different nations that tell about Noah's Ark in their, ancient, in their ancient history. And one of the books that I bought at Glen Rose, Texas, is this big book. And so, as you know, missionaries were sent over to the Native Americans, okay? The Indians, when they lived here, okay? Uh, and they sent these missionaries to tell them about Jesus from Europe and other things. When they got here, there was over 300 recorded stories from Iceland to Greenland to Alaska to Canada, the United States, all the way down into, into Florida, all the way down to South America, Mexico, all the way to the bottom, that the people who lived here told the missionaries about Noah's Ark, not the other way around. They told them there was a great flood. One family got on. They told them about the Ten Commandments. They told them about Tower of Babel and other things. How did these people know about these things? Especially the flood. How did they know? How did we get over 300 recorded documentations from missionaries that the 
people that lived over here already knew about Noah's Ark before they got here to tell them about it. Because there was a flood. That's why. Here's another thought. How about Mount St. Helens? Okay. You remember Mount St. Helens? If, I don't know how old you are, but if you're old like me, okay? Uh, this happened in my lifetime, okay? This is over here in, in Washington, and this thing just exploded. I mean, just exploded. It put ash all over the United States. It was massive, massive, massive. Just blew the whole side of that mountain off, okay? All right? Now, I want you to notice this picture here. This picture is a picture of this dirt. And do you see how it is layered? Okay, there's different layers here. I want you to see that picture. Okay, here's some other pictures that this is what it did. When it blew that mountain apart and then it blew off all the dirt and then that dirt over time dropped, deposited from the air, from rivers and a whole bit, you can see layers. Now, these layers just took a matter of weeks and months to form into different layers. Okay, you see that? The Grand Canyon has layers. Now, what do all of our archaeologists, well, a lot of our archaeologists say those layers came from? Well, the layer down on the bottom was that many billions of years ago, and then that one a little higher was a billion years ago and then a little higher than that was millions of years ago and it just kept going up and up and up okay well look at this this layer down here was may 18th 1980 june 12th in 1980 these layers came along and then in march 19th 1982 these layers came along okay it all happened in a very short period of time. So the point is this. That the world is not as old as people think it is. And this proves Noah's Ark. Because when Noah's Ark took place, man, it disrupted dirt, moved it, moved mountains, and shifted everything. Water will move anything. And it layered this stuff. And so instead of us thinking that these layers were billions of years ago, this proves that Noah's Ark can do that in a very short period of time. And it disproves all those theories because the Bible tells us that this earth is no more than 7,000 years old. And yet our archaeologists and other people that don't believe in the Bible, they say that this world is millions and billions of years old. Are you sure? Are you sure? In fact, Guess what? Mount St. Helen did in just a matter of about 15 days. It carved out several miniature Grand Canyons. There's one that didn't exist before Mount St. Helens. But our archaeologist says that the Grand Canyon took millions and billions of years to carve out. Are you sure? Just something to think about. In fact, when those trees, because it blew a lot of forest away at Mount St. Helen, when those trees were deposited, some of them fell into lakes, okay? And this is how they fell. They fell like this. And just look, some of the trees were actually buried in layers. And that's what people are saying, that like, like this red layer here would be this many millions of years, and then the next layer would be this many thousands of years, and then the next one would be this many hundreds of years, and, and so on. And then that tree would be stuck in that. Well, that can't be millions and billions of years old, because that tree got deposited there because of Mount St. Helen, and it's stuck in the layers. It layered it with the tree around it. Not millions of years, but days. That's what Noah's Ark could have done, did do, and it shows that this Bible can be trusted. Isn't that interesting? I think that's interesting. So then let me ask you this question. Who is on the ark? Well, let's see. Chapter 8, verse 18 says, So Noah came out together with his sons and his wife and his sons' wives. Okay? There was three sons. We know that from Genesis chapter 5 at the end. 
and then he had three wives. So there was eight people on the ark. In fact, if you go to well, uh, if you go to Mount Ararat and you go to that valley where they where I believe that flood that ark is at, uh, it is called the oldest name for that valley is the Valley of Eight. Isn't that interesting? If you go as far back as you can, the Valley of Eight. Eight people got off the ark. So here you see this timeline and you go all the way up from Adam and you go all the way up to Noah. Okay. All right. And then Noah's sons. Who was on that ark? Well, there was eight. There was somebody else on there. There was Jesus. There was the seed line of Jesus. God was preserving the seed line of Jesus so he could save us and get us out of our sin problem. Jesus was on that ark in the body of Noah. Okay? And his gene genealogy is going to come all the way down. So that's very important to understand. Now, there's always questions and what about this or what about that? And I'm sure you have all kinds of questions about, you know, were dinosaurs on the ark and things like that. And if you go to Kentucky, they actually show there there was dinosaurs on the ark. Uh, we have coins that date after the flood that have pictures of dinosaurs on them. Well, how do you, how do they know what dinosaurs look like if they weren't around after the flood? You see my point? Uh, we have pictures and paintings uh, on on walls and stuff by ancient people that made pictures of dinosaurs. How they know what they look like if they weren't around? But here's some problems. Okay. Here's a problem. What about the woodpecker? <laughs> I think this is this is kind of kind of cute here. Okay, I, I don't know. I don't know what they did with the woodpecker. They died as beaks or whatever, <laughs> but that that could be a problem. A little bit of humor here. Okay. Uh, how about termites? What what about termites? Okay, I don't know. I don't know if they they put them in a a metal box or whatever. I, I don't know, but that that could be a problem for sure. And and then of course you know being from Michigan and the beavers up there you know they eat wood uh, that could that could be a problem too I, I don't know yeah I'm sure you got lots of many more serious questions about Noah's Ark um, but we got to look at all this proof and the proof is just amazing and I believe this proof is very strong and so whatever questions you do have and well, what about this or what about that or how did this work or how did that work you're just gonna have to trust God. But I'm telling you, this story really took place. And this world knew about it. It made the world news. Conclusion. Now we're going to go over to the New Testament. And I want you to see how God uses this story of Noah. He's going to bring this up in 1 Peter. Now this is going to connect to us. This is, this is really the really important part here talks about these people, it says, who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved. Okay? So eight people were saved. But I want you to notice how they were saved. Peter says they were saved through water. Think about that. So you look over here, and here's Noah, and they're on that ark, right? And it says they were saved through water. So the question is, how did this water save them? Well, what did that water do? It swept all the evil and the corruptness out of, off of the earth so that Noah and his family could make it. They didn't get caught up in all that and just consumed. And that would have been the end of everything. So they were saved through water. Okay. Now, I want you to see the next verse. There is also an anti-type which now saves us. Now it's going to come to us. We, Peter was talking about Noah, how he was saved through water. But there's this anti-type, okay? What is it? It's baptism. Baptism? Does baptism save us? Well, let's see. Not the removal of flesh or filth from the flesh, 
So you can see that this is not a spirit, a physical cleansing. You don't use a bar of soap here. Okay. So this must be a spiritual cleansing. Now, when the spiritual cleansing takes place at baptism, watch what it does. It is the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is the answer. The answer of what? Of having a good conscience before God. When Adam and Eve sinned, they went and hid from God, right? They were ashamed because of their sin. But here at baptism, we can have the answer to a good conscience. And what is it? What is the answer? The answer is when I am baptized by faith under the New Testament, what happens? Well, according to Romans chapter 6, I'm buried with Christ. But what kind of people do you bury? You bury dead people. So you take this spiritually dead person and you bury them in Christ at baptism. And then Romans 6, 4 says you're raised to walk in newness of life. So death is over on this side, then you're buried, and then you're raised. And where, where are we being buried in? We're being buried in the death of Jesus. This is where we meet Jesus in his death. What did Jesus take to his death? Mine and your sins. And so when we are baptized, this shows an analogy of that same thing happening. You're burying that dead body. You're raising that person up to life. And that will give you the answer to a good conscience because what happens to your sins? It just like Noah. It was washed away. The corruptness is washed away. We say the same way Noah was. Connecting to water, connecting to baptism, which connects us to Jesus, and where we get into Jesus. So, the NIV says it's a pledge of a good conscience towards God. Uh, the New American Standard Version says it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. But the New King James Version just nails it. It is the answer of a good conscience. You want an answer to a good conscience, it is baptism. And unfortunately, our world is going to tell uh, a lot of people in our religious world, you don't need to be baptized to be saved. And that's just not right. I hope that you can have this good conscience towards God. I hope that you, by faith, were baptized into Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, raised to life, meeting Jesus in his death, and then continuing to walk with him the rest of your life. If you have questions about that, or you want to talk about that, please give me a call here at the Brown Street Church of Christ uh, in Waxahachie, Texas. And I would love to take your call. And we're going to get that Bible on, and we're going to see what it says. It's the answer of a good conscience. I pray you've been blessed today. I thank you so much for coming today. And, uh, and I hope that you can see that the story of the flood really took place and then see how God connects it so that our sins can be forgiven. Hey, we'll see you next time. I love you. Bye-bye.